Uh, joining me, John Petridis is a portfolio manager at Tocqueville Asset Management. Great to have you here today, John. It does seem like we're in this moment where our momentum trades that have been helping us stay afloat are breaking a little bit, but should we be freaking out yet, John? No, I don't, I don't think freaking out is the right word. I think using it as the opportunity to diversify. You know, the narrative is was all really from Halloween on. The narrative has been MAG7 growth, Fed's going to cut rates. And what you're seeing now is pushback on that. And uh, you're seeing value uh, on a relative outperformer versus growth. Uh, you're seeing the bond market uh, recalibrating to new uh, – outlook on where interest rates are going to be. And of course, you have fears of uh, what's going on geopolitically, uh, which is one of the main reasons why gold continues its rally. That feels like a very measured way to describe what's happening in bonds, John, recalibrating. Uh, I'm looking at the two-year yield ripping since last week. Dollar looks like it could have hit new one-year highs. I mean, is this recalibrating or is this return to 2022 situation? Yeah, well, I think it's uh, you know reality check to or the investors out there that for some reason at the end of last year priced in that the Fed was going to cut interest rates six times in 2024, which just was just preposterous. Uh, and now what you're seeing, and, and the bond market rallied very strongly. So the long end of the bond market is coming back to reality. And what you have is, you know, uh, Oliver, we should be the normal bond bond market is positively sloped, and obviously we're on on pace to break the longest uh, inverted yield curve. Uh, on record, at least since the, the 70s, where we have two years higher than 10 years. And are we going to get the bear steepener or the bull flattener? Very simply, is the front end of the curve going to come down so we go positively sloped again? Or is the back end going to go up uh, where you have the, the, the bear steepener? And, and what you're ultimately drawing a picture of is we are going to get to a positively sloped yield curve, but at a higher level. Uh, you know, you're not going to you're not going to have you will most um, again, unless the economy really slows and we do c fall into recession, let's say in the next you know 12 months, you're probably not going to have the two year at two percent and the 10 year at three and a half percent. If that's the case, that means the economy took a massive step function lower and slower and inflation really came down. Odds are that's probably not going to happen over the next 12 months. So if you do get a normalized yield curve. You know, it's going to be the, the two year coming down with, you know, let's say three and a half to four percent just for argument's sake. And the, the, the long end is going to be the 10 year is going to be four and a half to five percent, something okay. along those lines. This is really important, uh, John. I'm glad you talk about the curve, because even though a lot of folks have been trying to kind of push that conversation, they go, oh, we inverted. We didn't get recession. I mean, like, look, we got a couple of quarters of GDP that slowed down, but we bounced right back. The bear steepening is one we should be rooting for. But a lot of folks will look at the yield curve and they go, all right, well, traditional yield curve analysis tells us the uninversion is when the actual recession hits. But that's a bull uninversion when the Fed is forced to cut, right? I mean, yeah, this is that's very right. different if we just grow our way out of it. Yeah, that, that's right. And I think, I think Oliver, that's part of the reason why you alluded to earlier why the bank stocks were rallying to start the day, uh, because what you're seeing by reporting of some of the regionals is that so far you're not seeing a uh, you're, you're not seeing a, a rate of change in a, on the, the deterioration of the credit. Right, things are normalizing. Credit's not great, but it's not terrible. It's normalizing to pre-COVID levels. But at the same time, the light bulb's going on that wow. If we get a positively sloping yield curve at higher levels, the banks can make a lot of money. And th that's what you're seeing. And, and it's also part of the reason why value is getting a bid today uh, and, and growth selling off. Okay. So how much of this, John, uh, looks like an end to the growth trade as far as like the high momentum stuff, like how do we separate these things out from unnecessary froth, the pre-revenue stuff, the SPACs, maybe the crypto stuff versus, you know, growth that just got expensive, but still has real growth. I mean, there are some companies here that really are either benefiting from the upturn in the economy or being highly disruptive. Yeah, I mean, I think you just threw a lot out there. I think we're more in the latter 
I think there are a lot of high quality companies out there that may have just gotten a little too far out over their skis from a valuation standpoint. The market got a little too excited about the AI story. And what you need now during this earnings season and probably the next couple of quarters of earnings results is uh, you know verification that the estimates that are being put out is a true story. You know this isn't a bubble. That there is you know uh, a meat behind behind the estimates that are being put out there. That the AI story is true. That that's what you need to start coming through to validate the growth story a little bit more. If not, then you have to get back to the narrative of if and when the Fed will cut and by how much. Uh, to substantiate the valuations on the growth side of the trade. If not, you could see a rally here on value. And you know what? That's healthy because the, val the traditional value sectors of basic materials, utilities, energy, bank, uh, financials, they're very attractively valued compared to the S&P 500, which is so tech dominated. Okay. So right now, John, uh, for the buck, if we're looking to buy dips, uh, do we have to do it more cautiously or more specifically when rates are breaking out like this? Or can we just kind of blindly buy indexes and six month winners like we were the last seven months? Yeah. So as an active manager, I'm never going to say blindly buy an index, but you really have to be careful buying an index like the S&P 500, because as we've talked about ad nauseum for the past year and a half, it's so concentrated to the top 10 names and to tech. Uh, and so, you, so when you buy the S&P 500, which is a basket of 500 stocks, you think you're getting a diversified portfolio, but you're not. So you really want to pick and choose your battles uh, find the sectors that have been unloved by the market, even the regions that have been unloved. Um, you, you know, Europe uh, is, is really attractive from, you know, large cap European stocks that pay good dividends, trading at a big discount to the S&P 500. Uh, Japan, which, had done, which has done well to start the year, very attractive from a valuation standpoint, especially since the economy seems to be getting some inflation for the first time in eternity. So you don't have to be tied specifically to U.S. stocks, there is value to be had outside of the U.S. Okay. For international, does that include China? Hit me real quick, John, on what that looks like oh. to you. Because I hear a lot of international. Does that just mean chase Japan or what? Yeah. If you're going to play China, it depends on your investment time horizon. And if you're going to play China, that is the area and, and your investment time horizon is long enough that you could withstand what's going on politically and, and from a regulatory environment and, 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 and the, the, the nature of where the Chinese economy is today, that's where you're going to want to use uh, an exchange traded fund or something along the lines. So you could buy a basket of securities and not get caught uh, holding one security, which could get left caught holding the bag, like we saw in China in the summer of uh, 21 and 22, where basically the government was knocking on the door of certain companies and basically shutting that business. So uh, I do think there's value within China stocks, but you have to have the right time horizon and risk tolerance. And if you're going to do it, you, you look more towards uh, using an ETF and buying a basket rather than individual play. All right. Message received. Glad to have you. Great day to have you, John. Good to catch up and always appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for sharing it with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. We got John Patrice, Portfolio Manager at Tilgville Asset Management.